Hopefully I made enough. I just made some. And if, if I didn't make enough and you want one, I'll give you my card later and I can email it to you. I thought it was easier to do it this way, to actually give you something in your hand that has a lot of the information I'll be talking about today, because then you've got it with you and you don't have to take notes like mine. But you might want to add some extra notes. So my name's Heather Vale. I host several different podcasts, but the main ones that we'll be talking about today are two called Success Unwrapped with Heather Vale, which is at successunwrappedradio.com, and Internet Marketing Unwrapped, which is at internetmarketingunwrapped.com. Both of those URLs are also on the handout a little further down, because some of the examples I'll be talking about, I'm going to refer back to those. Now, I don't use all these monetization formulas on both podcasts. I use some of them on one, some of them on another. Some of the podcasts I use both. You can use all of these, or you could use a few of them. So, is everyone here a podcaster? Can I have a show of hands? Who's a podcaster? Who's making money with their podcast? Whoa! <laughs> okay, a couple. <laughs> If you're not making money with your podcast, who wants to make money with your podcast? Sure, why not? So, yeah, I mean, that's the point. I mean, some people say, ooh, monetization, ooh, it's a dirty word. You know, we're in it for the art. We've got to be pure and just do it for the fun. Fun's cool. We all got to do what we love. You all got to do something that you have fun doing. But if that's where it ends, how do you pay the rent? You're going to go to the landlord and say, well, I'm having fun doing what I'm doing, so I can't pay the rent this week. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So if you can do what you love and make money doing it, bonus. If you're creating content that you don't think anybody in their right mind would pay for, you might want to look at the content you're creating. So number one, you want to be creating good content, and I'm assuming that everyone who has a podcast here is creating good content, or you wouldn't be doing it in the first place. So you're creating good content, you're creating content that you love, now the last step is just making money off it somehow. This session was originally called Seven Ways to Monetize Your Podcast. Because when I signed up for it a few months ago, I was making money seven different ways with my podcast. I just added two more. So now the, now the seminar is called Nine Ways to Monetize Your Podcast. Now, the order of these are not in the order that I make more money at or less money. They're just in the order that it seemed more logical to, to kind of talk about them. So the first way... If you have a product or a service, the first way to make money off your podcast is to somehow incorporate that pro product or service into your podcast. Seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? But it took me a while to figure this one out. I have one podcast called Today's Success Minute. Now, what I did with that podcast, it, it started off as a daily one-minute success tip. After about six months or so, I switched it to a weekly one-minute. But during the first 60 episodes, I created two ebooks, two 30 day ebooks based on the podcast, which is another model that we're going to talk about later sales of derivative product. But it didn't click in at first that the people listening to my one minute podcast might want to buy the ebook. So I wasn't saying at the end of that podcast to get the Today's Success Minute ebook, go to todayssuccessminute.com. Instead, I was telling them if you liked this, one minute podcast and you want bigger success tips with interviews with experts, go to my other podcast at successunwrappedradio.com. So I had the right idea of driving my audience from one of my products to another product, but I wasn't thinking that, hey, these guys, sure, they're interested in podcasts or they wouldn't be listening to my podcast. Sure, they're interested in success or they wouldn't be listening to a podcast on success. So my thinking was, okay, well then, with those two factors, I'm going to drive them to another podcast about success, instead of thinking, well, maybe they don't necessarily want the podcast. Maybe they just want those one-minute success tips. Maybe they'd rather have an ebook. And I could have been driving them to my ebook this whole time. So there you go, thinking about what might the audience like. If you have a gardening podcast, a weekly podcast about gardening tips, and you've written a book about gardening, tell them at the end of the podcast, go buy my book. In fact, because you're a loyal listener, here's a coupon code, you get a discount on my book. I know one guy, he's got a podcast called Mr. SEO. 
gives the podcast away for free, tips on SEO, search engine optimization, but he also has a service where he will search engine optimize your website. So obviously at the end of every podcast, he's telling people, here's my website, if you're interested in my services, come back here. So the podcast becomes a leveraging tool for your main business. Now if you don't have a product, that's where we get to number two. However, you can also use number two if you do have a product. It's just another way to supplement sales. And I have found that number two, affiliate sales, is where more podcasters make money than any other way. So what's affiliate sales? Affiliate sales, okay, same idea, the gardening podcast. So you want to drive your people at the end of listening to your weekly gardening tips, drive them to somebody else's book about gardening. Or drive them to the local gardening, uh, tell them to go to you know, this gardening website where everybody goes and buys their gardening tools and you've set up an affiliate link and you make a percentage off every time they go to that podcast or to that website. Now, here's where it becomes tricky. I don't know if anyone's done any affiliate marketing. Is anyone familiar with? Okay, so you know that the affiliate link they usually give you is this long thing with question marks and equal and FID equals and these numbers and stuff. You're not going to say that on your podcast, right? Okay, so if you want to go to this great gardening website, go to oneshoppingcart.com forward slash FID equals question mark 11475. <laughs> hey, no, it's not going to work. So what you do is you create an affil a, a redirect link on your website. So if I'm interviewing an author, this is a great way to tie this in. So at the end of my podcast, okay, for the past half hour, I've been talking with Jack Canfield. If you would like to get chicken soup for the soul, go to successunwrap.com slash chicken soup. So they type in successunwrap.com slash chicken soup. They're automatically redirected to amazon.com or to Jack's website. My affiliate link's already embedded in. So that way you're making your affiliate link into something that you can actually speak in your podcast. It's an audio medium, so we might as well make use of the audio. Now there's other ways you can use that affiliate link as well. And I've used it with great success putting it in, for instance, the show notes. So you say something like, on this week's episode of Success Unwrapped, I've got Jack Canfield. He's the best-selling author of The Chicken Soup for the Soul Empire, and he's written this book called Success Principles. And every time you mention one of his books, that's a link. They click on the link. Ooh, I like this interview. I like this book. They buy the book. You make some money off that sale. Now, if you're interviewing mostly authors, I have to warn you, there's not a lot of money in affiliate marketing of books. You make a couple of bucks if someone buys the book. So you might want to look at what else can you put together with them or if you have a guest who happens to have an online presence who is marketing online stuff, generally digital products will give you a much bigger commission. So for my second podcast, Internet Marketing Unwrapped, the podcast portion is actually the secondary portion. What happens with that one is it's a live teleseminar. Every week people dial into my teleseminar line live. They listen to me interview an expert about how he has made millions of dollars online in certain niche. And then at the end, they get to ask their questions live, so they're engaged in a live format. And then what we do is we'll offer them, okay, we've got a special for you this week if you buy the guest product this week. So what you're doing is you're leveraging your content by selling something that the guest has. But it's not really selling, it's a soft sell. They don't have to buy it. There's a lot of good information that they got out of that hour-long interview. Most people don't buy anything. If you're delivering the good content, they're going to be happy with that. But there are a few people that that's just what they need. That's what they need to build their online business, or that's what they need for their garden. You know, that's the fertilizer that they didn't have that they should have had, or, or that's the one scoop that they should have had to dig up those roses that they, they didn't have. So what you're doing is you're giving them a lot of content, and then if you want more, this is what you do. Now what I've listed is, is something I call teleseminar format under the affiliate marketing section. What the teleseminar format is, it's, it's a proven way. People are making a lot of money doing teleseminars this way. Is you get the people in the live interactive format and then you give them the chance to buy the product, but that's not where it ends. 
you give them a chance to buy the product. Sometimes it can be time limited. So if you're buying this within the next 48 hours, or the first 20 people to buy this get a certain discount, or we're throwing in this extra bonus. Now, if you're going to podcast it after like I do, I'm not a big fan of the time limited stuff. Because I want my podcast listeners to be able to get the same deal later. So I'll ask them, okay, well, instead of doing a time limited thing, or, okay, if you want to do a time limited thing, that's cool, but instead of doing just a time limited thing, how about if we also let them do an ongoing thing? So if someone gets the podcast three months from now, they can still get that deal. And I still get the sale because it's still through my affiliate link. Now, the benefit of doing with some of these people that are selling online stuff is you usually get a 50% commission or better. So it might be a $1,000 product, it might be a $500 product, it might be a $47 ebook, but if you're making 50% of that, that's a lot better than making $2 off a book on mm -hmm. Amazon. So figure out what the audience might want and give them something where you both benefit. The customer's getting a good product and you're getting a good commission. So you're actually making more from the same time. So besides just doing this in the audio, though, there's other ways. You can put the affiliate link, like I said, in the show notes. You can have a link section on your website. So these are all the links that have something to do with the show. I don't find I make a lot off the link section, unless you're specifically saying to people, okay, this is the best link section on search engine optimization audio, and I've got the best podcast on search engine optimization. So every time you go to this link section, you know I've got the best products there. This is, this is the resource on the web. This is the only place you have to go. Then you're going to make money off that link section. Otherwise, you may or may not, but there's nothing wrong with putting it there. You can put some banner ads on your website, affiliate banner ads, so every time they click the banner ad, your affiliate link is embedded and you make the sale again. And if you don't have a guest who happens to have a product that you can leverage this way, that you can get related products too. I've put down three of the best, ClickBank at clickbank.com. ClickBank is 100% digital products. So if you've got a podcast on dog training, they've got hundreds of dog training ebooks. If you've got a podcast on gardening, they've got hundreds of gardening ebooks. In fact, you can you can target it down further than that. Rose gardening or iris gardening. You just go in there, you type your keywords, what you're looking for, and it'll give you all these products. You take a look at it. You just type in what your affiliate ID. It, the same one goes into every single product link. It's very easy to do, and it's generally 50 to 75% of the sale is what you get. So you go there looking for products that you can leverage with your audience. So you can put them again, you put them on the page. You can also work that into the audio. If you don't have a guest that you're interviewing, oh, well, I just interviewed so-and-so a guest, and here's his book, here's his product, go check it now. If you've even got an, a podcast where it's just you talking, say, oh, well, today I found this great ebook on rose gardening, and I know that you guys really love it, so if you want to check it out, here's the link, and again, you do the redirect link, and they go check it out. If they buy it, you get a commission. If they don't buy it, no big deal. Now there's another thing, there's a product called Have Ads, H-A-V-A-D-S dot com. That's not an affiliate link, by the way. If you go there, I don't make any money off it. I do have an affiliate link, but I didn't want to include them in this. Have Ads, it looks like a Google AdSense ad, but you can make it your affiliate product. So it can be a ClickBank ebook. You position it on your page so it looks like a Google AdSense ad, but when they click on it, it actually takes them to a ClickBank product instead. So we'll go into the pay-per-click in, in a couple of minutes, and you'll see how the pay-per-click ads work. But the way that the have ads work, it has nothing to do with the content on your page. You can pick it. So for instance, I've interviewed Joe Vitale. He's got a few ClickBank products. So when I go in there, I put, get Joe Vitale's latest book on manifestation, click here. And it looks like a Google AdSense ad. People will click on it. If they buy, you get a commission. If they don't, you don't. So the other thing, this is, this is actually a new one I've just started to play with, number three, paper lead. Now paper lead, I kind of look at as a diff, it's kind of halfway between affiliate marketing and pay per click. So it's not about selling your opt-in list, okay? Don't do that. <laughs> 
if you look at my number one leverage tip is to build an opt-in list. And I can tell you more how to, how to do that. Sorry, can you say, tell them what that is? An opt-in list? Okay, so an opt-in list is like a newsletter list. So you can do something like on your podcast page, say, to get my weekly newsletter on, and obviously it's going to be something related to your podcast. So if your podcast is about cat breeding, sign up for my weekly newsletter on cat breeding, and the people will go there and, and sign up. They give you their email willingly. They give you their name willingly. They know when they sign up that they're on your newsletter list, and they can unsubscribe at any time. That's what we call an opt-in list because they are willingly opting in. You're not forcing them to give an email. You're not harvesting emails. You're not buying emails. They're giving you their email willingly. Now, building a list like this, a newsletter <coughs> list, an opt-in list, that's going to be your number one way to actually leverage future sales, whether it's affiliate marketing or whether it's your own product, because you can send them an email once a week. Here's my new podcast, blah, blah, blah. You give them the link for the affiliate product. Or maybe a few days later, you get another affiliate product that comes to your attention that has nothing to do with the guest, but it still has something to do with the niche. Oh, I know that you like Jill Vitale on this week's show, and hey, his friend just released this ebook. I thought you might want to take a look at that too. And you send them to that product. You're not forcing them to buy. If they buy, they buy. You make money. If they don't, they don't. So building a big list is one of the best ways to make money online. And I have actually done what the, uh, what the big list builders, they call it a squeeze page. Does anyone know what a squeeze page is? One. OK. Because <laughs> I told you. <laughs> So, yeah. I have a question about the, the products. Sure. Um, so, like Joe Vitale's ebook, you read it first to see if it's any good? Yeah, I do. How does that work? You buy it? Like, how does that work? No, if you've got a relationship with the person and you've mm -hmm. interviewed them, I ask for that stuff before I interview them. Because I'm a journalist. I'm not going to interview someone if I haven't read their book first. Because that gives me half my questions. Right? So, they're going to be giving me that stuff for free. Uh, I've even had people mail me their book book. I was like, okay, well, I want to interview the, you for this show, but I really need to read your book first. Okay, well, I'll mail it to you. They send it to me. You know, it takes a week or whatever to get there. I schedule the interview for a few weeks down the road. So I've already read the book. I already know it's good. Or the other thing is, I mean, once I've read three of Joe's e-books, I know that his other ten are probably as good. So based on my knowledge of Joe's reputation, I will say that, yeah, this is good. But usually he'll let me have it for free. So that, that comes in the process of producing your podcast and building the relationships with your guests. Now, if it's someone else that I haven't interviewed, sometimes I get them to give it to me for free, too. I'll say, okay, here's my podcast. Go check it out. These are all the people that I've interviewed. Would you let me have your ebook for free so I can promote it to my list? Usually, nine times out of ten, they're going to say yes. If they say no and it's a product that I really want to promote, I might buy it because I'll probably make that money back. But if they say no and it's, you know, take it or leave it, then I'll probably move on to something else. So, good question though. Actually, feel free to ask me questions because, you know, I don't know. So, sorry, I'm going to follow up. Yeah. What, if, what if it sucks? Then I won't promote it. You won't, you won't tell what I was going to tell you? No. No, if I think it sucks, why do I want my customers buying it, my people that I've built a relationship with, why do I want them buying it saying, why the hell did Heather send me this ebook that sucks? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's your reputation, too. You're building an ongoing relationship with your subscribers. They get to the point where they know you, like you, trust you. When you recommend something, they trust that you know what you're talking about. So there's no point sending them to buy crap, because, <laughs> you know, they'll just all unsubscribe, and then where are you? Start from scratch. Yeah. So, so how frequently do you do the disclosure then that you're making money when you put the the link in your your newsletter or when you recommend? If something? they are on my internet marketing list, they know because affiliate marketing is one of the things that I've helped them learn through interviewing the guests. Affiliate marketing is one of the main <laughs> things that we talk about when I interview those internet marketing experts. If they're on my success unwrapped list. They won't necessarily know. I'm not going to say, go buy Joe's ebook so I can make some money off it. But most of them know because it's, it's pretty well common knowledge that if someone's recommending something that they are going to be. So more likely you'll see someone saying, this is not an affiliate link and I'm not making money off it, if that happens to be the case, which is very rare. So you can pretty well assume if you're reading someone's email newsletter 
or you're reading an email that you opted into their list and they're sending you an email, 99.9% .9 of the time they're making money off telling you to get that product or else they wouldn't be telling you. So pretty well assume that they are making money. And I assume that my audience knows that I'm making money and if they have a problem with me making money by telling them about this great ebook, they can unsubscribe. <laughs> So squeeze page, I was going to tell you what a squeeze page is. So a squeeze page basically, when you get to a website, before they get a chance to actually see most of the content, they're giving you the name and email. So you're telling them, if you give me your name and email, I will share with you all these great interviews that I've done with all these people, or I will give you the secrets to growing the best roses, or whatever it happens to be. You're telling them when they get there, this is what I'm going to give you or maybe you give them a free ebook. That's really popular. I'll give you my free ebook on rose gardening if you opt into my to my newsletter list. So they either choose to give you their name and email address, or they don't. There's nowhere else they can go from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, for building your list, they're, they're not necessarily effective for quality people yeah. on your list. Do, do, uh, is there resistance to this stuff? Because frankly, when I see it, I'm going, oh God, not Some of them, but then those aren't the people you want on your subscriber list. If I've got interviews with Joe Vitale and Jack Canfield and Bob Doyle and all these other people I'm going to be giving you, you know, I'm giving you 30 interviews that I've done with these top success experts and all you have to do is give me your name and email address. If you don't want to give me the name and email address, well, okay. <laughs> as far as you're concerned, they're, they're an effective tool. Yeah. And I know when I go to someone else's squeeze page, I'll read what are they offering, do I want to be on another list, is it something I want, if so, I'll give them my name and email address, if not, okay, well, I don't. You know, it's totally up to the consumer, it's totally up to the end user whether they want to give the name and email. If they don't, they don't. And you know what? Some people will give their name and email address, download the free ebook that was promised, and immediately unsubscribe. Okay. That's part of the pro, you know, it says right on every email, if you wish to unsubscribe, if you don't want to receive my information anymore, click here. Now, I should say, does everyone know what an autoresponder is? Sure. Okay, so you're going to want to be using a professional autoresponder, either Aweber or GetResponse are the top ones. So those automatically come with an unsubscribe link every time you send an email. So you don't have to worry about this person sending me an email saying remove in the subject line. It, that's not the way it works anymore. They get their email, they read it, at the bottom it says if you wish to unsubscribe, if you don't want to hear from me anymore, click this link. It's there on every email. So you've never got people on your list that you forced to be there or that don't want to be there or that aren't interested in hearing about your newsletter or aren't interested in hearing about what you did on your podcast this week. Those people are going to unsubscribe. Are you interested in knowing why they're unsubscribing? No. No, I don't care. <laughs> I'm more interested in why the people are subscribing who are subscribing. If people are unsubscribing, then cool. Let them. Sorry, I totally disagree from my experience. I really want to know why they're unsubscribing. Yeah. But you can't get caught up in that because then it all becomes, oh, what did I do wrong? I mean, there is, a lot of people are doing a thing where when you unsubscribe, they've got a form, do you mind telling us why you left? And some people will fill that in. Oh, you sent me too many emails. Now, if you get that 100 times, you sent me too many emails. Oh, okay, well, 100 people thought I sent too many emails. Maybe I should stop sending so many emails. But it's a learning opportunity. I mean, maybe yeah. it has something to do with the content of what you're giving them. Maybe there's an expert you've been waiting for that you haven't given them. So if maybe that's that important to you. Maybe to be the person that has a, a podcast of their own with 10,000 listeners. And but if that's important to you, then yeah, follow up on that. Implement one of those survey procedures. For me, that's not important why they're unsubscribing because I figure most of my people are on 10,000 email lists. So they're going to unsubscribe from a few. I don't get that many unsubscribes that I'm going to be worrying about it. If I was getting 100 unsubscribes a day and my email list suddenly dwindled to zero, then I'd be going, okay, what am I doing wrong? But if I'm getting more subscribers than unsubscribes, you know, that's good. Actually, that just goes to my question. How many people do you find that uh, just subscribe, get the freebie, and then unsubscribe? 
is it like a, a large portion or? I don't actually track that. Okay. You could I mean, if like, you wanted to. Do you have a ballpark? Is, no. Like it trend? depends okay. on the list. Like if okay. you have a list on gardening, as an example I keep using, if you get a bunch of people that want your rose gardening ebook that you've written, then you have to look at okay, how many people on Instagram. If you if you find that you downloaded all these ebooks, people have been downloading your ebooks, and all of a sudden you don't have a subscriber list. That's something you want to look at. But I find that most of my people do keep on the list. Now, when you go into your autoresponder, you can see how many unsubscribes were there on the first message, how many unsubscribes were there on this broadcast that you sent. So you can track that. So you can see, okay, three people unsubscribed when I sent this email, and you'll see. Like, if it says a thousand people unsubscribed after the first email, they downloaded it, then immediately unsubscribed. You can see that. So, you can track it if you want to. It's just, it's not something I'm concerned with until I see the numbers being something I should be concerned with. Because I know I'm offering valuable content to those people. So, it's, it's not something that I'm worried about tracking. But, it, yeah, if, you, if you're developing your list and you don't know if they like the ebook or not, or you don't know if you're offering valuable content after they've gotten the free ebook, sure, it's something you'd want to track if that's what you're interested in. And there are ways to track all this stuff. So pay per lead means when you send them to an offer, they're probably getting something for free. And again, on that end, they are opting into something. And they may or may not uh, opt into that. And if they do opt in, then you get paid just for the fact that they opted in. That's what pay per lead means. So you're getting paid just for the fact that someone opted in. Now, pay-per-click, on the other hand, that's like Google AdSense where you've got, it's what they call a contextual ad. So it's taking content from your page and it's giving you an ad that's related to content on your page. I don't spend a lot of time with the pay-per-click stuff. I don't find it makes me a lot of money. You can make a, a site that you're totally focused on making money from AdSense. And I've listed some of the other ones. If you like the other, if you don't want AdSense, there's other competition uh, search engines that will also pay you for pay-per-click. But you know, if it's something that works for your site, you might want to do it. If not, not. Is it also because of what you're selling on the other side that you is worth more? So why? No, do you because want to the. Um, I mean, like, why would you pollute it with clicks if you really want them to buy No, the reason, why I, money the reason why I don't want them to click on the ads is because then I'm taking them away from my podcast. Right? From the affiliate purchase at the end. No, because the podcast, like I said, most people are just listening to the content. Okay. It's like, it, with affiliate sales, generally you're looking at like 2% of people will buy. So, if I'm interviewing Jack Canfield, that interview is not going to be all about, let's sell Jack's book at the end. The interview is going to be about, okay, what's the law of attraction? How can people use it? What are these other success principles that you teach? Oh, if someone doesn't have what they want, what, what should be the mindset where they get what they want? By the time you've listened to all that, if you want to buy Jack's book, you'll buy Jack's book. If you don't, you don't. It's not about selling them the thing. That's just a way to leverage the content that you're making. Because if I'm going to spend an hour on the phone with Jack Canfield, do I want to just give it away for nothing? Now, I feel that the content is worth something, and most of the listeners do too. So if they want to follow up and buy his book because I recommended it, that's cool. They're getting a great book, and I'm getting a commission. It's a win-win situation. There's no forcing people to buy stuff in the affiliate marketing model. You're never forcing people to buy something that they don't want to buy. You're never giving content just for the sake of selling it. If you do that, if you make a content, a, a podcast where the content is all about buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, you're going to have no listeners. Nobody wants that. They might as well just watch an infomercial. <laughs> infomercial is actually, it's more about the commercial than the info. There's no info in an infomercial. It's all about buy this product. But people know that when they watch it. So they'll watch an infomercial if they're interested in the product. That doesn't make the infomercial bad. That's just the model of an infomercial. You know, the only information they're getting is rega is regarding buying that product. The nice thing about AdSense for me, anyways, is I mean, I have a radio show and I don't actually have a podcast at this point. Right. But on the on the blog, it's kind of so simple to do, and I like it because it has something to do that 
my website. Yeah, it's related to the content. And I mean, it, it does enough to pay for the hosting and all that kind of stuff, but it's a no-brainer almost because you don't really have to do anything with it. It's yeah. a good first step um, if you're not doing anything. Right. Yeah, it can be. Can I add that? Yeah. I don't like AdSense because my website's about social commentary and um, and uh, feminist humor, and of course, when Google AdSense goes through it, it adds a student production <laughs> ads and ads that oh, I don't want. Oh, like totally not related so, to the content. That happens sometimes. I did AdWrite. Okay. And I, I opted for AdWrite. So it gives you the same thing as AdSense, but you get to pick what your filler spaces oh, okay, are okay. before they show up. Okay. And you can pick and choose, and people can actually rent space. You know, per week, per month, whatever you post, and it's very simple. WordPress has a plugin. Well, WordPress has plugins to hook anything. It's really easy to type it into WordPress. And probably Google doesn't allow ad break on if you're using ads. They just really changed those terms. They do let you have, that, yeah. yeah. They just changed it so you can have other contextual ads as long as they don't look like AdSense. So you can use ones like uh, Chitika and Cantera are a couple of new ones where they they actually show a picture of whatever the product is so people know that, okay, this is a picture of a baby stroller if you happen to have a parenting podcast. So you see, oh, a picture of a baby stroller. Oh, okay, they click on that. It doesn't look like an AdSense ad. It looks like a okay. banner ad more. Yeah, I just like the ones that, it took a while to find ad but it, it, that's one that lets you pick ahead of time rather than rejecting, so. And again, it's gonna depend on the content of your podcast. So exactly. your content happens to be content that what it brings from AdSense isn't what that's you want. Right. <laughs> AdSense lasts about 30 seconds on my site mm -hmm. to like those yeah. <laughs> now, if you happen to have a podcast about SEO, chances are you're going to be getting related. But again, you might be sending them to your competition. Like my Mr. SEO example from before, he wants everyone to go to his SEO optimization service. He doesn't want them clicking on AdSense and going to this other guy that's selling the same thing. right? So you got to think about your podcast, think about your content. But you can't exclude, works. I think, in AdSense. You can exclude specific, uh, specific sites or companies. But that would take a lot of research yeah, well, to know all your, <laughs> all your content. But it's kind of, any one of those services, I think, are kind of a neat first step, only because they're contextual and you don't really have to go too crazy with them and it yeah. kind of gets you going. So the, uh, the next two, I'm going to put together five and six, derivative product and sales of archive shows. So what I do is I let them have the free podcast that's available for a certain amount of time, and then after that they can buy the archives. Derivative product means I'm going to make an ebook out of the transcripts, or I'm going to make a CD out of the audio and the transcripts combined, or I'm going to take all my interviews that happen to do with manifestation and I'm going to make a manifestation collection. Or if you've got the gardening podcast, I'm going to take all my people that talk to me about roses and I'm going to make a rose gardening collection and I'm going to make an orchid gardening collection. And you sell the collections as e products on their own. And then you can have your own affiliates too. Uh, sponsorship, that sounds like one of the most basic ones. I do a lot of sponsorship through PodTrack. So you get to pick if you do you want to include the sponsor in your podcast or not. And if you go with blueberry.com, I've included the link there. They also work through podcast, but they or through PodTrack, but they give you more opportunities to get in on the deals if you want. So it's gonna be something like if you want to be in on this sponsorship deal, you read this 30 second commercial, or you make up your own little 30 second thing to go at the beginning of your podcast, and you include a banner ad, and you include it in the show notes or something like that. So you decide, is that something I want with my podcast or not? It's totally up to you whether you want to do that or not. Donations, again, I don't do a lot with that. I find that people, I've got a podcast donation button that automatically comes where I host my podcast, podomatic.com, they automatically put it there. And sometimes people will donate. If they do, cool, but I don't tell them to. But it's one way, if, if you don't want to use any of the other monetization <laughs> models, but you want to say, okay, well, you know, I'm not making any money, uh, here's, my here's my donation button. You can do that too. And the last thing is what I call selective podcasting. So what I do now is I give them, if I interview Jack Canfield for an hour, they get 20 minutes for free. And that's a lot of great content. And if they want the rest, they join my membership site. Or you might do, I think Lisa sells them a CD if they want to get the whole interview. So it's like, okay, here's some great content, but I've got more, and if you want more, here's how you get more. And that's, uh, that's in a nutshell, that's the nine ways to monetize your podcast. Any more questions? Yeah. How do your interviewees feel about you selling the entirety of their Well, I own the content, because 
the media outlet always owns the content. If CTV walks in here and interviews you, they own the content. You don't own that interview. If the Toronto oh, Star writes an article about you, they own that content. So anyone that I interview is media savvy enough to know that I own the content. And you know, some of them ask, well, can I use it too? And if they do, I usually say, yeah, okay, well, what are you going to use it for? Oh, I'd like to offer it as a bonus to my subscribers. Okay. Do you have to get them to sign any kind of, like, this, uh, like you can. or anything like that? So you you can, can if you want. Uh, basically, the way that media works is an implied release. If someone walks up to you on the street with a TV camera and a mic and asks you a question and sticks a mic in your face, it's an implied release that you know you're on TV. That's not totally same. true. Um, I work at CTV, and for news, it is. Yeah. But for anything non-news now, it's getting very, very, very stringent, and you need to get release forms. Like, if you even have, like, a wide shot of somebody now, and mm -hmm. there are people in the background, technically, you're supposed to get the release forms. So, I mean... So, yeah, it depends myself, on the medium. Yeah. So, you have to know that. Now, for instance, when I interview someone... I, include, I, I keep a recording of the whole thing from the time I call them until the time we're done. So at the beginning of the call, you get this whole conversation on tape of, oh, what are you using this for? Oh, yeah, this is for my podcast, successunwrap.com. It's at successunwrapradio.com. I'll send you the link afterwards. This is what I do with the content. So 20 minutes is going to be for free, and then the rest of it goes in my membership site. That's all in the recording. That's the release. So, yeah, it's like, like if we're going to interview someone on a TV camera, you do something like, okay, can you spell your name for the editor so that when the editor edits this piece, they know how to spell your name. So you've got that all on tape. That's, that's your digital release, so to speak. But you can do it on paper, too. It depends on the medium. It dep depends what you're using it for. And I that's think the release in Canada. Do you think it's the release in the States? Yeah, it's pretty well the same in the States. Okay, my name is so-and-so, and I give you permission to use this for blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. Can I just hold on to that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Heather, what do you recommend to people that are doing this like as a quarter job or a half time job as far as which ones to start with? Like when you know we got um, kids affiliate or marketing number one. <laughs> Sorry? Affiliate marketing. If your podcast is in a niche where there happens to be any products that you think are valuable to your to your listeners that you can make money at, affiliate marketing is always number one. Okay. If you don't happen to have a niche where <coughs> there's anything you can sell, you can't find anything in ClickBank, you find, can't find anything on Pay.com, then start looking at the other models, but I'd always start there. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the selective uh, podcasting. When, when a person wants to get the full show, um, do you provide them like with a password and they get access to a restricted part of your site? Or yeah. You, okay, that's right. Yeah. So you have recordings of the whole show on yeah. this restricted part? Right, yeah. It's really following on from what you were saying about the effectiveness. I'd be interested to know in terms of revenue generation, um, you said affiliates are um, successful. What, what kind of would be the ranking for each of these that you might have? Um, well, see, that, that would depend on my podcast. Like, I've got a friend who does a, a podcast, it's called Raw Vegan Radio. Very niche specific. He only interviews authors that talk about raw vegan food. And he makes a ton of money as an affiliate selling these authors' books because his audience is extremely niche-focused. That's all they want. So my audience is having to be a little broader. So I don't make as much off affiliate marketing as he does because my audience is also interested in this and this and this and this and this. They're not so dedicated to this one thing. So it can go either way. Someone like Jack Canfield, I mean, most of my audience already has his books. So they're not necessarily going to buy it just because I interviewed them that week. Yeah. But definitely affiliate marketing is number one. If you have your own product or service, I'd put that at number one. Mr. SEO with his SEO optimization service, that's, that's his number one. That's the only thing that he makes money off of. So that should be the number one. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up. Any final? All right, thanks everyone.